Good morning, everyone. I pray everyone is doing the best that they can during these times, and it is good, and thank you for taking time out to come and gather. I want to thank those at home who are tuning in, and we welcome you as well. And uh, what a blessing it is to come and worship together and then come to open God's word. So important, especially these days when that's not taking place over pulpits. But we will stand firm to do that, for that is what we've been called to do, is to open God's word. I do want to give a shout-out to the Army. It's their birthday today. <laughs> but come November 10th, we're getting the full band, Marine Corps band. I have connections. I used to work at headquarters of Marine Corps, so stand by. No, happy birthday. God bless you guys. It's always good to celebrate our nation's uh, armed forces, especially the Army, and all that they're doing, and men and women who are overseas and on the lines and doing things we don't even know uh, in, in our protection. So God bless our armed forces. May they continue to stay strong in these days as well. Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 19. We're going back to our, the book of Philippians, studying through verse by verse. Let's pray. Oh, by the way, as we're turning to Philippians, if you're, do we have any new, do we have any visitors here this morning? Can you raise your hand if you're, God bless you, welcome, sir. Anybody else? God bless you guys. I saw you guys walking in. Anybody else? God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. Hey, on the way out, we all going to leave this way out. This is the only exit out a- after the service. Please grab a, we have a bag there. It's a, it's a, what do we call the bags there? Gift bag. And uh, there's some blessings inside, but there's a little card. If you have time to fill it out and then just drop it in, in the black box or you can drop it in the mailbox outside and we'll get them. We just want to uh, thank you for visiting us and And may the Lord bless you guys in that. So let's pray one more time. Father, we've opened up the word of God. And as we always ask of you, that you would open us up. That we uh, come, Lord, now through the time of worship, uh, prepared to uh, worship you in the word. We know this is your word. These are your scriptures, Lord. Uh, Written by uh, men, yet inspired by the Holy Spirit. Empowered moved upon by the Holy Spirit to write what you wanted to be written down. We ask for the application, God. We ask that as we look and finish chapter 2 that you would give us the application, the illustration, Lord God, that you would speak to us through your word, going beyond my notes, God, as we always say, and that we would leave here, what, different than the way we came. We ask this in Jesus' precious name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. It's good to hear that. It's good to hear you guys speak. The word, uh, the the title of this message is Modeling the Mind of Christ. When you think of modeling that word, there's a lot of definitions, but one of the definitions uh, that I found by by Miriam is an example for imitation or emulation. An example for imitation or emulation. And and that's really the thought that I had in in entitling this this message. Um, Paul has been teaching the church at Philippi about love and unity and humility, right? Giving to us the greatest example of each, and that is in the person of who? Of Jesus, all one of you. God bless you. And... uh, Yeah, of of Jesus Christ. He he, he exhorted us, didn't he? There in Philippians 2, 5. Look at it. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The greatest example for us who has come to show us what it is to have his mind in a sense. And we don't center our fellowship around a moose, do we? We don't center our fellowship around an elk. Right? Nothing wrong with those, I guess. I've never been invited to one of those. Don't want to be, by the way. 
Uh, all I remember is the Flintstones. There was the, you know, that hat they wore. And what was that club called? Huh? The Water Buffalo Club. Or uh, No, guys, we don't center our fellowship around a set of man's thoughts, agendas, websites. We center ourselves around Jesus. He's the center. There's even a song somebody wrote. That Jesus, you're the center. We don't gather to sell a widget, a prayer cloth. <laughs> we don't gather around to empower and lift up a man or a woman above the name of God. But we gather to glorify Christ our Lord and Savior. We need to know that. And he's our Lord and our Savior because that's exactly what he's done. He saved us. And he's become our Lord, our center, the one we live for and the one we want to emulate at the best that we can in the power of the Holy Spirit. In our times now more than ever, man, people want togetherness. Come on, people now. Remember that one in the 60s? They want people, they want gathering, they want togetherness, you know, and, uh, and, and fellowship. And that cannot truly uh, and deeply happen unless we have the mind of Christ, unless we center our lives on Jesus Christ, unless we really desire to emulate Christ, to, to model after him. The, the mind of Christ will not allow us to criticize another person especially another Christian or a fellowship, another church. The mind of Christ thinks of others better than themselves. The, the mind of Christ is, is having a kind of, of tenderness that is the, the, the opposite of cold, bitter, and unfeeling. Uh, and, and in order to think and be like Christ, you have to know Christ. Amen? Do you know Christ? Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't mean do you know the historical Christ. Uh, I don't mean, do you know the Christ that sometimes is used in, uh, in curse words? I'm talking about the man that came, who be, God who came and became a man and died on the cross for your sins. Do you know Christ that way, Messiah, the one who has saved you? Because in order to think like Christ, in order to have that mind of Christ, you have to know knowledge, intimate knowledge uh, you know, the uh, personal relationship with Christ. Uh, Jesus, as I said before, needs to be studied and, and then lived out as, as we grow in our faith. Studied, lived out, trusted, leaned upon. And then we began to live out our faith, displaying his attributes supernaturally natural by the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons why he came in the flesh was not only to come as a man, to die for man, but to show us that he truly is, just not by words. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And that in this skin suit that we live in, temporarily, this tent, that we can do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. God expects spiritual fruit, not religious nuts. I don't know if I stole that, but if I did, it's mine now. <laughs> Guys, listen. Also, let, let me speak to some of you who are in a place of mentoring. And that should be many of you, unless you just came to Christ last Sunday. We should always be in a place of mentoring. We should always be in a place of, of leading others. Uh, uh, we, we call it discipleship sometimes. But it's, discipleship is just more than that, really. But that we must be Christ-minded, that we can't be self-centered, we can't be Mark-minded, because then we're making disciples of Mark, or disciples, you know, that's, that's not what the Bible wants, he wants disciples of Christ, and as we are mentoring or leading, we are also continuing learning ourselves, no one stops, no one makes it, we, we haven't made it, you know, 20 years with the Lord, I've made it, don't need to read the word of God no more, no, We never make it. Making it is heaven, amen? Making it is seeing him face to face. Making it is hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. 
And what we have learned so far from chapter 2, and really chapter 2 is all about that mind of Christ, exampling and, and seeing Jesus as the, the, the main example for that. And it builds this Christ-like attitude in us. If you remember, obedience to the Lord, working out daily what God has worked in by grace, and that is what? Your salvation. Do all things without complaining. <laughs> um, be without fault. Living above reproach. Uh, shining as a light in a dark world. Uh, holding fast the word of life. Holding fast. Not putting it on a shelf. Not, not, not uh, uh, neglecting it. And we've all been guilty of that. Uh, holding fast the words of life. The word of life. The word of God. The logos of God. His son. His word. The scriptures, so important for us. Paul speaks of two other friends in the ministry, as we will see here, who have also modeled the mind of Christ, as if Paul was also a great model. We know that. But he mentions, as we close chapter 2, two very close companions, two close friends, who, who models this mind of Christ. So we're going to do the best. I'm going to do my best to bring that out. Hopefully you've read ahead and, and you too can maybe point, see some things that how Christ-like these men were. And we're speaking, of course, about Timothy and Epaphroditus. So let's begin in verse 19 where we left off the last time where Paul is writing. He says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. Paul said earlier that I, uh, I'm being poured out as a, as, as a drink offering and the sacrifice and service of your faith. We know that, remember, I remind you, if, if so those of you who are new here, Paul is incarcerated. He's in Rome. He's incarcerated. Uh, it's his first incarceration for Rome. Uh, it, it's, it's like being on house arrest. He's, uh, he's assigned quarters, but he always has a... Uh, a Roman guard with him. He's always attached to a Roman guard, which is kind of cool to be attached to Paul because you're always going to get a sermon. And we find out in, in, in this wonderful book that many came to faith, not only Roman soldiers, but many uh, who lived there in the palace, the palace guards and, and the servants. Paul was just, you know, such a, a gospel living man that as I said, supernaturally natural just in his speech and his dictation uh, to, to other churches. These soldiers would listen. They would listen to what he's saying. They would even probably have personal conversations with Paul. And, and Paul would just, he was just an evangelist. He was just a, a man of faith who, who shared his gospel and lived it out. And they, they got to see both. They not only got to see it in word, but they got to see it in action. He, he walked the talk. And, and so Paul, uh, as he closed our last time, he says, hey, I might be being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of, of your faith, and I'm glad and rejoice with it. If, if I'm going to be the sacrifice, if I'm, if I'm going to be the one paying for the name of Jesus Christ on your behalf, and it will be on their behalf for now. We know the persecution is coming. We know uh, the history of Christianity, the good history. The persecution did come, and, uh, but, but, but Paul says, if I'm going to be the sacrifice, I'm fine with that. I, I do want to go. I, I do want to see you again, but if this is, this is where I'm at, I know that for this same reason, you also will be glad to rejoice with me. And then he says, but I trust. I trust to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. So he, he, he has this heart for the Philippians. He has this heart for the churches that he planted. And, and that's a good thing. Many scholars believe that Timothy was saved during Paul's first missionary journey, going back to the book of Acts when the ministry team uh, visited Lystra and Derby in Acts chapter 14. If you're taking notes, verses 6 through 7. But it wasn't until Paul's second missionary journey that he heard of a certain disciple who was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra which is, again, Timothy's hometown and Iconium. Here in verse Acts 16, 1 and 2, it says, Then he came 
to Derby and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed. But his, but his father, notice that, his father was Greek. And I thought I had it in my notes, but let me continue to read in verse 2. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. So Timothy was well spoken of by the folks there, by the believers there uh, at Lystra and Iconium. Iconium. His witness, listen guys, was contagious. Can I say that? Can I say that about myself, my walk with Christ? Is, is my witness contagious? Now again, we're talking about our witness for Christ. We're not talking about being, uh, you know, uh, uh, someone who is, who is religious and yet uh, someone who is obnoxious. Uh, no, this is my true walk with Christ, my witness to others. Timothy, this young man, was, was such a one who was just contagious. He was well-received. People were blessed by being around him. He was just... He was just so in love with Christ. He was just so motivated, so encouraged. His witness was great. And although we read that Timothy's father was a Greek and probably, we're inferring, not a believer, but Paul writes in 2 Timothy, Timmy, 2 Timothy 1 5 about Timothy's upbringing. And I'm going to bring an application to this. It's there in 2 Timothy 1 5. It says, When I call to remembrance the genuine, in the Greek, that means uh, without a mask. It's anupokritos. It's, it's unhypocritical. Without a mask. There was no phoniness to it. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in who? Your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. And I am persuaded is in you. In 2 Timothy 3.15, it says, And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You see, friends, Paul didn't lay the foundation of Timothy's faith. That foundation was laid in the home. That foundation here came through the grandmother and the mother, who at one time were Jewish but came to faith and were completed in Christ Jesus. And if the father was a non-believer, was a Greek, the grandmother and the mother ensured that their grandson or her son was going to know the scriptures and going to know the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And here, here's the application. We see the importance of the home being the base for moral and spiritual grounding. The home for moral and spiritual grounding. Many times the moral grounding is there. But the spiritual application is left up to the child. Well, when they're 18, they can pick and choose what they want. to. No, that's wrong. We've got to teach them about Jesus Christ, about the Lord God. Well, when they get older, they can flip a coin. If they want to be this, that, or nothing, that's fine. I was at a, 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 I guess, a a reception. We were at a reception, my wife and I, and we were sitting with a a couple about our age, you know, young, good looking. But, um, and somehow, you know, we were just talking about our kids and and they shared, yeah, just yesterday we were at dinner and our our son came to us and says, I'm I'm an atheist. And he was all nervous to tell his parents because they were Christians. And I love what the response of the mom was. He goes, well, Jesus loves atheists too. And then he's like, oh, (laughs) Jesus loves atheists too. And that just continued that seed that they planted in that young man. And, of course, you know, prayers go out for him. That he's just trying to check out and check things out. No, it probably was the fact that he wanted to go out and do some things and live out in that world like a prodigal. But instead of, you know, bashing him and instead of, you know, sending him to his room, which he was, I think, he's bigger than they are, taller. 
uh, she just loved on him. She just loved on him. Even though his father was supposedly a non-player in his son's spiritual upbringing, which unfortunately is not unusual for the times that we were living in, the father is never around or the left. But that didn't stop his grandmother and mother. They made it a priority to train up Timothy in the ways of the Lord. And what a blessed, what a blessed uh, uh, son he became, huh? What a reward. What a reward. It doesn't always happen that way. Again, Timothy is his own person, and he could have chosen to respectfully receive from his grandmother and mother, but then he could have he could also reject it in his heart. We have some here that are, we have prodigals, don't we, in this, in this sanctuary. We need to pray for our prodigals because Jesus loves prodigals as well. As I said before, God has the greatest prodigal, and that's Israel. And we're all told to pray for Israel. Well, we need to pray for our prodigals as well. But in this case, it was a wonderful reward. And they knew it began, it begins in the home. They knew that parents need to raise up their children. And they need to raise them up. And they too need to model. And they too need to walk the talk. And they realize, and we realize as parents, it begins with Jesus. It begins what God requires of us from Micah 6, 8. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. If our children see us fudging on our taxes or, or not paying for that pen or pencil from the store, just walking out of it, if they see us modeling that, then they will what? They will walk after us. They will walk after Now, we're not, per, uh, you know, it, it's not perfection because when we do blow it, we, we've got to be parent enough to uh, tell them that we're, we're sorry, that we we messed up. We got to be parent enough to tell them that what we said or what we did wasn't right. Forgive us. Man, that goes a long way with our kids. That goes a long way. And plus, we're, we're teaching them that too. We're teaching them repentance. We're teaching them forgiveness. We're teaching them, you know, these things. But it begins in the home. Because from the home, then it should be encouraged and supported at the church. So church life is important for us. As parents, coming to church is important for us. Of course, we should we should have a local church. We should have a place where we go. Those of you that are visiting, I pray you have a local church. If you're looking for one, we'll be here to to answer any of your questions afterwards. By the way, but we should have a local body of Christ that we are engaged with, engaged in, and eventually serving. Because uh, it's important, and our kids should see us serving. They should again. We're modeling who? We're modeling Christ. We're you know. In some cases, this is the only time Christ is truly spoken of in those children's life. And we thank you for thank Shauna and Seth and them who are who are taking some of these kids and and teaching them the love of the Lord. But we're only here really for most of these kids because if it is happening in the home, we're only here to. What is that word? To build up what you've already established, to encourage them and what you're training them up to be. And then prayerfully, and it always comes to that time when you're 18 or 19, they leave. And hopefully everything that they've learned will be applied in that world out there. Because in that world, they're there to change the mind of our children. They're programmed to change their mind. And they do it so good and subtly, don't they? Because the enemy is subtle. He's deceitful. And so when we send them out, when they go out, as hard as that is, I don't care if they're going out to a Bible college or to a a, a secular college, man, you know, we need to continually be in communication with them and ensuring, man, that they're staying firm, but they've got to do it themselves. It's difficult, man, being parents, right? But it seems that Paul then invited, back to our, our study, Paul then invited Timothy to join his missionary team. 
And as we've told you this, and you guys know this, uh, he's be, he, he became Paul's protege. And as Paul would say, his son in the faith. I love that, his son in the faith. Timothy's name, by the way, in the Greek means God honoring. You couldn't beat a name like that, right? And as you get to know Timothy, he would live out, he would live up to his name. As we get to know Timothy also, guys, listen, I want you to understand this, that uh, he, he was young, right? He was in ministry very young. And again, of mixed race. So being young, he was timid, and we know the letters of Timothy, the pastoral epistles, he became a pastor. But he was timid, he was young. He was a young leader in, the, in a world of elders, not the title, but the, the sense of uh, the congregation. He was the boy preacher to them. And the Bible tells us that he had issues with that, or people had issues with him, but he was encouraged to stand. So he was young, he was timid, he was of mixed race, as I said, so he had social problems. Half Greek and half Jew. He had social problems as well that he had to overcome, and really the people had to overcome their prejudices. That's why he, when Paul brought him on the mission field with him, he had him circumcised so it would not be a hindrance to the ministry because he knew what was out there. His own people would reject him. And so he said, we're going to get you circumcised. And all the men said, thank you. (laughs) So we're going to circumcise you, son. But it's just for the ministry. He didn't circumcise Titus. He didn't. It's not about that, but he knew, and he was teaching this young man. We, we do things for the ministry. We do things for, for, for the cause of Christ, for the furtherance of the, of, the, of the Bible, of the scriptures, the furtherance of ministry. We just don't want this to hinder us because there will be a constant battle. I know my people. So this. But he had social problems. Uh, he was timid. He was fearful. He, he was stressed out. He was uh, anxious. Uh, that speaks of a pastor. Anyway, he had emotional problems. And he was sick. Uh, he was not a well young man. Uh, he had stomach issues, probably because he had anxiety. He was probably because he had those physical problems. He had some kind of problems with his stomach. He would take some wine for medicinal purposes besides a staple of, of, the, of the beverage that they drank at that time. Um, ministry, half, sometimes ministry like happens, doesn't it? He had physical problems, but God, listen, guys, listen, God uses our weaknesses or God uses our social hindering for his purpose for the furtherance of the gospel. God uses those who are weak. God uses those like Timothy powerfully. Power. What did he have to stand on other than the scriptures, his faith in Christ? If it was just about Timothy, again, if, if they met to lift Timothy up rather than Christ, if they met to look at Timothy as the, as, as the model of, of man, everybody would say, forget that dude, man. But no, God uses our weaknesses to empower us with the strength of the gospel and the ministry. Don't ever forget that. He goes on to verse 20. And my, there it is. To say, for I have, notice this, guys, I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. Timothy has been mentored by Paul by applying the scriptures, investing his time in practical ministry, spending time with Paul. Can you imagine having Paul as your mentor? That'd be awesome, right? It's also dangerous, (laughs) old lumpy. But uh, Paul characterizes Timothy as being like-minded. That word is interesting. It's it's called equal-souled, equal-souled. It's not a word you throw around a lot. 
equal soul. My wife and I, I, I believe we're like-minded. We're equal souled. After 30 some years, we better be. And as Paul displayed the mind of Christ to his intern, he, he was like, as I said last time, he was like a sponge. He was a good disciple. He was a student. I've come to learn. I've come. But it, again, it's, it, 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 it was the practical aspect of it too. He says, 21, for all seek their own agenda. So now he's explaining here. He says, there is no one like-minded with who will sincerely care, sincerely care for you. He goes, because of this, this is why. For all seek their own, right? That is, their own agendas, their own causes. When, when, when someone wants to serve and, and maybe even start a ministry, you know, as leadership, we find out, well, What's your heart behind it? And, and, we, and, and we'll talk a little bit about here the testing aspect of it. You know, let's take some time and, and, and let's see you work in the nursery first or, or perhaps see you being an usher. Let, you know, what's your heart behind this ministry or a ministry you want us to get behind? For, for what purpose? And, and, and of course, most of the time, it's for the purpose of Christ. It's for the furtherance of the God. It's for the, it's for the uh, education of the body of Christ to, to, to know what's, you know, and, and those things are good. But Paul has come into the ministry and he realizes, and, and he said that earlier as we, as we studied, that there are some churches, right? There are some who preach Christ from what? Selfish ambition. He says it right there in chapter 1, verse 16. Not sincerely, he says, but from selfish ambition to build the ministry around oneself. And he says, this is for all seek their own, usually centered around what I can get rather than what I can give. And that's the sin of entitlement. The sin of entitlement. Planting churches for selfish ambition. Being in ministry for selfish ambition. I'm entitled to this. I've waited a long time. I've had, God bless people, God bless them, I, I love them. But I've had, I've had wives come up to me and tell me, well, my husband should be an elder. I mean, he's over 50. And he's, he's been a Christian for, you know, for 50 years, whatever. It's, right, it's time for him. It's, you know, and we get these things, you know. Guys, can I just tell you we make lousy Holy Spirits? Have I told you that? We make lousy. And God bless her. She, she, you know, she wanted the best for her husband. She wanted the best. But where are they? They're not even here no more. You know, where are you? Where are you? And so a lot of things like this happens. The sin of entitlement. He said, notice verse 20, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Guys, the only thing we are entitled to is hell. And by the grace of God, we've been saved. By the grace of God, we've been pulled out of the pit. Amen? And put on the solid rock. We're not entitled to anything, man. The cause of Christ is our agenda. As believers, for it causes Jesus to be glorified. It causes Christ to be glorified, man. Our purpose and mission is to reach others with the gospel, fulfilling the great commission, making disciples of all nations, equipping the saints once they gather for service, equipping the next generation who are going to be the next pastors and elders and ministry leaders and, and youth leaders and children ministry <laughs> Overseers, and this is this next generation, and this is why we're broken now with what is going on today. Because that generation that's going to be our pastors, you know, you see them out there, and again, nothing wrong with marching, nothing wrong with protesting a good cause, amen. But don't they look like sheep without a shepherd? We need to reach them, they need Christ, many of them do, and they're out there, and you see them. Yeah, we get mad when 
the violence and the rioting and the, you know, the, the destruction and the, and the killing. And they're like sheep without a leader. And a, and, a, and, a, and a group without a leader is called a mob. It's called a mob. At least that's what, anyway, that's what was told to me in the military. And here, as we fulfill our mission, despite the possibility of persecution, uh, as that song goes, to build his church, to love his bride, and to make his name known far and wide. That's what we are to do. And so Paul lays it out. This guy, Timothy, he is like-minded with me. He isn't seeking his own. Um, he, He doesn't feel like he's entitled to anything. And so he continues to move on and talk about his protege. Verse 22, he says, but you, Philippians, but you, church, he says, but you, Philippians, notice, you know his proven character. How do they know it? Because, again, Paul took him on his missionary journeys. That, that, that they, got to see Philip, uh, they got to see Timothy. He says, you know his proven character. That word proven character is do keme, and it means tried and proved after testing. Tried and proved after a testing. There's nothing wrong with being tested. There's nothing wrong with being, you know, uh, tested in the church to see if, if this is, like I said earlier, if you're walking for the cause of Christ or if you need more discipleship or if you need, you know, uh, one-on-one uh, counseling and what it is to be a believer in Christ, whatever the case may be. But this is, he was tried and proved after testing that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Timothy was ready for this ministry because he had proven his character and heart through tests, trials, found worthy. And this Paul had not to convince the church of, for it was evident. It was just evident. Oh, Timothy, yeah. Oh, man, that dude, man, that dude's on fire, man. That dude loves the Lord. He'll do anything for, for, for uh, uh, the church. Or he, he'll go out of his way for a non-believer to just sit and expound. With, you know, just, they just knew who he was. And it was evident. And I think we need to take time to grow as well. We need to take time to grow. You know, and, and it starts with patience and commitment. Then tasks done before being asked. Tasks done before being asked. And while in the trenches of service, allowing ourselves to be tested for further ministry. That's what I was speaking about earlier. You know, that, 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 that God bless that man whose wife thought he should be an elder. He never really did anything. Never, we never even had a chance to even you know, look, look at what he did. There was no time to test because he, he was in and out. He was... Uh, First one in and the first one out. Uh, no, that, that's not the heart. It takes time to grow. He says, verse 23, Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. Spoken just like a father. Uh, don't think this is difficult for Paul. As his mentor, he finds it hard to let go of his disciple. He says, you know, what a blessing it would be uh, for me to send him to you uh, because I know as he has served me and you know his reputation, that is a tremendous blessing. But as soon as I see how it goes with me and whether Timothy stays longer or leaves immediately, it was uh, Paul's decision, it seems, for Timothy was willing to do whatever he was asked of him. And he'd say, Paul, Paul, whatever you need, man. I love that. Whatever you need. Uh, I was telling my son, I said, look at Pence. That is a good second. That is a good second. That is a good advice. If you want to know someone, especially 
in, in the cabinet that was recently. That man, have you seen him? He stands firm. He supports, he supports the man who he serves. He supports the cabinet. Whether you agree with the current president or not, look at Pence and, and just this man who, who's there and committed. That's when you want to see a second or a third or a fourth, that's the servant you want. He's his own man. He speaks from his heart. But this is a guy that, this is like a Timothy. This is a guy that's there to serve, you know. He's articulate. He's well spoken of. He has a great reputation back in his state as governor. And he's, he just, you just, you know, sometimes you want to say, Donald, stop texting, man, or something. But he's just there. He's just there. And he's there to serve. I love it. I'm not getting political. I'm just telling you, if you want to see a person who's a great second, look at him, study this man, just the way his countenance and everything about him. Anyway, he says he hopes to send him as soon as they see how it goes with me. I mean, MacArthur says being available to the Lord essentially meant being serviceable to the Lord's apostle. Boss, whatever you need, boss. I'm here, man. As late as you need me, as early, whatever you need, I'm I'm willing to go. But he says in verse 24, but I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. So Paul's heart, again, is in heaven, right? But he realizes his feet is on earth. And he's living between those two worlds, which we've entitled this whole book. But he trusts and hope in the Lord. And whether Paul did visit Philippi or not, I'm kind of leaning more on the not. But there are some now, as I'm studying, that believe that maybe he did visit shortly. But anyway, he makes it very clear that Timothy is just as qualified, just as sincere in his love for the church to serve with the same heart as Paul has. And until Timothy is released by Paul, and that's difficult. Planting a church is difficult. Having a church plant was difficult, uh, you know, when when the King George plant happened. It was difficult because there's friendships and there's long friendships and long times in ministry with many of these people that left, Pastor John and them. But we know it was needed. And we know we were like-minded. For the cause of Christ. But until that time, he says, you know, I plan on coming shortly. But uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's just difficult for Paul. But he knows what's best. But until he's released, he goes on to speak of another servant who modeled Christ. And that is Epaphroditus. Verse 25, he says, yet I consider it, I consider it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. I'm going, to send, I'm going to send Timothy. Uh, I know he's going to bless you guys. He's, you guys already know this man. He's tried and true and tested. We are like-minded, sold together. But until I do, he says, I'm cons- I consider it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus, whom we only meet here in Philippians. The only in the book of Philippians we read about him. And we don't have much, do we? So I'm going to kind of read between the spaces uh, based upon his name and, and of course, what the scriptures here we draw for. Uh, we draw out about him and this faithful servant. Because you don't really get to know a lot, but his name says a lot. Um, he is named after Aphrodite. Aphrodite. The uh, that goddess whose is her name is the, the name is inserted in his in his name Epaphrodite. It means belonging to Aphrodite. Am I saying that name Aphrodite right? Okay. The Greek goddess of love. Some people call me Maurice, <laughs> whom the Romans called Venus. Oh Venus. That's the fifties. You guys. Where's Doc? You remember that one, right? I would say Tom, but Tom and Ogie are over teaching for Pastor John Wallace, for Walt, John Wallace up there, and they wanted to say hi to you. They're, they're not hiding from us. But, but, but the, 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 the Romans called Venus. The Greeks, of course, called it the goddess of love. 
So what does that tell us, just quickly, if I can read between, or, or his upbringing, it seems, was the opposite of Timothy's, that he, he lived in a home of, of pagan followers uh, of this goddess, and he was named after their idol. Many people sometimes name their children after their idol, like Elvis, you know, hello, baby, or, or like me, Rico, as in suave, but that happens. Usually we, we name our dogs after them. But anyway, moving on. But listen, this story didn't end there. Somewhere down the line, somebody shared Christ with this man. And we see the power of the precious gospel that we talked about and constantly talk about. The power of the gospel, the power of, of, of Calvary, the powerful word, and how the Holy Spirit comes to woo the sinner, to, to pull upon his heart, to, to uh, call him or her to both knees, not just one knee, both knees to hit the ground in humble acceptance of Christ Jesus and how God can take someone and set him free from dead paganism to serve a living God, amen? You've got to see that. It's got to be. Somewhere down the line, he turned his back on his upbringing and worshiping of pagan idols and this pagan idol that he was named after and accepted the true and the living God. And now he belongs to Jesus. He no longer belongs to Aphrodite. He belongs to Jesus and being used now for his work in ministry. No longer looking at his past whatever that entailed, and you can study Aphrodite and, and how they used to worship that goddess. I'm not going to go into it. We, we did when we were in, I think, uh, Ephesians. But, um, but he, he, he passed the world behind me, the cross before me. Amen? That's this man. Paul identifies him as my, notice this, my, there, um, in, uh, in verse 25, the second, second part there, my brother. The word my there speaks of a personal, deep, loving relationship. My. That's what Christ does. Paul was the greatest racist <laughs> there was. He hated Gentiles and especially hated Christians. And here, when God took a hold of him, and he became born again, boy, he changed his heart, right? His heart no longer the same. And now he's calling this former pagan Greek, a pornographic worshiping man who grew up in a house of pagans, my brother. My brother. And why is that? Because of Christ. He says, he is my brother in Christ, the same Lord. He says, fellow worker in ministry, the same cause of Christ. He says, fellow soldier in battle because they know they have the same enemy. But your, Philippians, but your messenger, apostolos, that word means. It's where we get our word apostle. In a broader meaning, that in the original apostles assigned by Christ, it is one sent to be a commissioner of Christ. Paul said, your commissioner, your missionary, possibly even some scholars believe that he was the pastor of Philipp, uh, at Philippi. But we know that he was uh, one who was well respected. He was one who was important. Again, Perhaps just a missionary, one who was sent from the church, 
Philippians 4.8 tells us with a financial gift to help support Paul while he, was, while he was in prison. But he was a brother, a fellow worker, and a soldier. He was in the fight with Paul and the others. And he was very much loved. Very much loved by the church at Philippi. He says, one who ministered, Paul says, to my need. I love that. Paul had needs, by the way. Let's just quickly on the side road. What time is it, yo? Paul had needs. We got needs. Paul had needs. He had, a, 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 you know, spiritual needs just to be in fellowship. You know, he had a physical needs, you know, uh, and he had financial needs. And here comes the uh, who, who from this church that blessed him to help with his financial needs, that, to help him with some of the things that he probably needed for his physical, for his physical needs. And I believe that Epaphroditus was able to, to bless Paul in, in all three, in all three of these areas. He says, verse 26, since he was longing for you, that's a, a longing desire, a very long desire for, for the church at Philippi, like a shepherd who, who, who leaves the 99 to tend to the one, which is an important mi- uh, ministry as well, which is an important reason to leave. One has left. I must hasten after that, that one sheep. And he leaves the 99. He leaves the flock together, but he still has a desire for them as he's away on a, another important venture, another important mission. And that's what Paul... That's what that word says. That that he's like a shepherd who leaves 99 to 10 to the one. And his heart is still with his flock. And that's the heart that Paphroditus has for the church at Philippi. He says, and he was distressed. That's troubled. The word picture here is one who is, again, like I said, one who is away from home. Although on an important mission, but he's burdened with an unselfish concern for the church that he left, for the fellowship, the body that he's left. There is there's this unselfish concern. It, it, he, it, it speaks of one who's away from home. He says, because you, church, has, this is the reason why, had heard that he was sick. Who told them I was sick? I didn't want anybody to know. How'd they find this out? And I don't want them worrying. I don't, you know, it's enough. They, they've got enough on their plate, you know. And, and, and who told them that I was, that word means without strength. I was in a weakened condition. I, I don't want them to worry about me. And, and, and this is what, he was so distressed, he was troubled that, that, that they're there worrying. And I don't, I want them focusing on the Lord, not me. I, you know, he's a faithful worker, man. Epaphroditus would not leave his mission uncompleted. He was a loyal soldier. He would not leave the battlefield under fire. But his distress for the flock and not for himself shows what a wonderful man this guy was. His love for the flock, his love for the Lord. He says in verse 27, for indeed... Paul writes, he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Ministry does that sometimes. We, we serve together, we, we love together, and, and then maybe one goes home to be with the Lord. And Paul's... Paul says, man, the Lord spared the sorrow of of losing another brother, like-minded, servant. I mean, these two guys loved each other. And when you spend time with other ministry leaders and other ministers and other pastors and elders, that that kindred love, that love for one another grows. And, And we know, again, if he would have died, he'd go home to be with the Lord, that other world, the world called heaven. But Paul saw God's mercy not only for his fellow 
um, soldier and healing him of his illness, but his mercy upon sparing him the deep, deep cut in his heart. As he says, sorrow upon sorrow. And that speaks a lot of the things that Paul is, is, is seeing and, 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 and experiencing. But again, he would, if that would take place, he wouldn't grieve like non-believers grieve without hope. And Paul, who had a strong faith and solid theology, but he could hardly bear the thought of being separated from another close friend in ministry by death. He says in 28, therefore I sent him the more eagerly, diligently, a word that shows care and concern in doing for others, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may, and I may be less sorrowful. So again, his sorrowful upon sorrowful, pardon, sorrow upon sorrow was not so much Paul looking and feeling sorry for himself, but he always had this, this sorrow, this 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 emotion for the church, and if he can send Epaphroditus back to them, it will be a joy for him to know that they would receive him again and that they would be rejoicing and that I may be less sorrowful, at least in in that aspect, at least in, in one of the churches, because the other churches were breaking his heart as well. Corinthians and Ephesians and some of these other churches that were starting to look toward legalism and, and starting to take on some of the, you know, the, the attributes of, of flesh, of a fleshly life. And, and he had sorrow because he cared so much for the churches. Paul was other-centered, and he, he knew in sinning Epaphroditus that it would not only bring joy to the church, but it would bless Epaphroditus as well, being back with those he loved and served. I call Epaphroditus the mailman because he's the one who would carry the letter of Philippians and Philemon and these other letters to the churches. He was Paul's messenger. He'll do whatever, whatever the boss wants, whatever the Paul wants, whatever you got. Paul, I'm here for you. I'm at your, you know, I've been sent with this gift to bless you. If you want me to send these, take these letters back, I'll do that. It's never easy when people let alone ministry yoke brethren leave to pursue a call from God or members are led, truly led, to leave and join another church. Let me just tell you that. It's never easy for the elders or the pastors. But sometimes the call comes, right? And you're led. And that's a sweet thing. Yet Paul knew his loss would be Philippians' gain. Receive him, therefore, verse 29, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. The word in esteem is entimos. It means precious. Used in describing being Jesus as regarded by God as precious, uh, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. Uh, You see, when you serve the Lord with the same like-mindedness, you take on his attributes as a bondservant to him. Hold him in esteem, hold him as a precious vessel of God being used by God, he says. For that's what he is. He's precious. <laughs> I love it. He's useful. He's obedient. He's humble. He's broken. He's there to serve. Whatever is needed, he's there to serve you guys. Because, verse 30. For the work of Christ, there it is. He came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. His ventures and being sent from the church to go to Paul, the things that he encountered on the way or the physical infirmities that he went through, whatever it was, come battle or high water, whatever it is, he was going to fulfill his mission. He was going to be there. He came close to death. He didn't regard his life. That word means to throw aside, not regarding uh, or, or disregarding, voluntarily hazarding one's welfare, 
putting one's life on the line for the work of Christ. Man, that's, you talk about a soldier, man. You talk about someone who's just called to the ministry. There it is. So as we leave this morning, the team comes up. Let's take on the mind of Christ. Let's really go over this chapter again. Study it. Ask ourselves questions. Am I modeling, and I'm including myself, am I modeling for others Christ's characteristics? And it's, it's going to change others around me. And it's going to change in different ways if I begin to walk like Christ and talk like Christ and act like Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Be Christ-like. Some will leave you. Others will cling to you. (laughs) What do you got, man? You're contagious. (laughs) You're contagion. You know, what do you got? I got Christ, man. I just got Christ, simply put. I just got Christ. You know, it's been said, sow a thought, reap an act. You guys heard this, right? Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a destiny. And we know that that can be used, and it has been in illustrations for good and bad, right? Depending on what kind of habit it is. But let us be in the habit of modeling Christ. And that can start today. You see, friend, if you're here today, you don't know Jesus Christ. It starts today. Because today's the day of salvation. Today, what does that mean? Today is an opportunity that you have in the most safe place you'll ever be called a sanctuary because the church is here to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We talked about two men modeling Christ, two imperfect men. One who has a pagan background, which the other one who was yeah, raised in the home, but he had his physical problems. He had his, you know, social problems. He had, you know, he was flesh, just like us. He, he cowered. He wanted to run away from ministry. He would, he would, and Paul kept him, encouraged him, you stay. So we're not, Jesus says, I don't, I didn't come for the perfect because no one is perfect. He's come for the weak. He's come for for those who know that they're lost and they need to be found. And if that's anybody here today, then as we pray, I'm going to say a prayer, and it's just called a, the sinner's prayer, to receive Jesus. If you want to do it, you're serious. You want to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. Or maybe there's some here that are the prodigals that I talked about last earlier th- uh, uh, in, this morning. Maybe you're that prodigal. And for whatever reason, God has you here this morning to come back to him. Start serving him. Start taking on the habit of being Christ-like. So let's pray. If you're serious about receiving Christ, you want to receive him, just, you know, God knows your heart. I'm just going to say a prayer to kind of formulate it in words, but God knows your heart individually. Because what you're doing is you're receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Just a simple prayer like, God, I'm, I'm a sinner, and I admit that. I, I realize I'm a sinner, God. And, and, and I also, I also understand that Christ Jesus died for my sins on the cross. He bled for my sin. And because of that, God, I receive your son, Jesus Christ, as my Savior right now. I receive him. I repent of my sins and I receive Christ to come into my life and change me. If you're a prodigal here today, you, you've been far away from God. Um, on the outside, it doesn't look like it, but God knows your heart and he's calling you to come home. It's time to come home. Just get, Lord, I've sinned against, just pray, Lord, I've sinned against, I've sinned against you. God, I I, I sinned against what you've done for me, God. 
And now here I am. I've come back, God. I've come to your open arms. I hear your call and I'm obedient to it, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And listen, if you prayed that prayer, if that's anyone there, on your way out, there'll be an usher out there. There's a Bible called the Start Bible. We want to give that to you. The Bible has a lot of information in it besides the Word of God, which is the most important information, but a lot of answers to your questions. It was written that way. You say, I got a Bible. Great. Pick up, take that one as well. Because it has really a, a, a discipleship program within it that will help you get through it. Tell the usher, too, if we can just get your name, your first name. You're not, you're not, you don't have to join this church. We don't have membership, by the way, but you're welcome to come back and welcome to fellowship with us. It's not about that. It's about your heart. It's about your soul. It's about where you'll spend eternity. Amen? Once you give your last breath on earth. Church, God bless you. Hang in there. These are crazy times we're living in. We've got to pray for one another. Pray for our enemies. You know, witness as much as you can. Be a witness to those who need a shepherd, who need love. In Jesus' name, amen.